Thanks, Richard. Great introduction and quite true, actually. I've been trying to stay away from the sweet bar because I'm a little bit concerned about what all of that sugar and all of the, those drugs might actually do to me. Um, actually, I couldn't have asked for a better opening to this uh, panel discussion than the conversation that um, you've just heard from Tim, which really, I think, summarises a bunch of facts that you will have heard today about just how connected customers want to be and what they want to do in their lives. They want to buy, they want to research, they want to get help, and they want to complain. And they want to do it on any device, anywhere in the world, sometimes from their beds, and they want it right now. And many of you will be sitting there thinking, how on earth do I actually respond to those demands? Not just from an IT perspective and the technology platforms, but also as a business leader. I read a recent global survey by a consulting organisation, PwC, and they said that one in five IT and business leaders felt equipped to deal with the digital age. Four of those leaders really did not know how they were going to work their way through it. So together we've brought today a bunch of panel industry experts who spend most of their time talking with those connected customers and the leaders that are trying to grapple with how they support that, not just through IT platforms, but also as, as leaders of their own organisation. So let's introduce them. Uh, to my right, far right, Belinda Nash, Hi. Head of Social Media at Socialize, <laughs> PR guru, blog expert. <laughs> sure. She works with leaders in business to help them to embrace social media and to support how they actually want to personally communicate with that connected customer. Ed Hyde, Senior Vice President at Telecom Digital Ventures. Ed is leading the development of services to support smart data, mobility and applications. And most recently, he's led the team that has launched Curious. Some of you will have um, seen that in previous workshops a service to help businesses capture the wealth of data and turn it into meaningful information to drive business growth. To my left, Murray Dobson, who's leading his own change management consultancy business these days from his headquarters at the beach. <laughs> Most recently, he's been at Westpac, where he introduced in-branch digital marketing and uh, in-branch uh, digital marketing and mobile banking platforms. And so therefore, he deeply under understands how trends like online and self-service uh, affect an organisation's IT platforms. Um, and finally, Karen Codd. Karen has the auspicious title of a data and CRM strategist. And she's worked for organisations like uh, BNZ and Draft F FCB as a media company. Karen's focus is how we can obtain and utilise correct data to confident, confidently implement strategies that will actually drive real customer advocacy as well as brand affinity. So given the knowledge and experience of this team, I also wanted to provide an opportunity to you as an audience to ask any questions that you might want of this panel. So in a wee while, I am going to ask for the lights to come up and see if there are any of you that have questions that you'd like to, dir to direct to this panel. So please have a think about that um, and be prepared to raise your hand. Quickly, we'll have folks with microphones who can come and help us facilitate that. But let's get underway, I think. So the first question I have here, and, and I'm going to direct it to you, Murray, um, and Belinda tells me she's got a bit of a controversial uh, a view on it as well. What do you think the biggest challenge is that businesses are facing in the age of this connected customer? Thanks, Joe. Uh, being first up. Um, <laughs> the, the biggest challenge is always a hard one to describe. The biggest, I think, uh, rate of change is, is an obvious big challenge, and, and there wouldn't be one organisation that doesn't you know, face that every day with uh, their base platform or, or the, the bits that support that are constantly moving and which bits do you pit, pick to keep up with. Um, that, that's part of the challenges. I think it's actually past that and I, I think when I look at my own experiences and, and the challenges we face as an organisation such as Westpac is actually understanding the customer's expectation and actually picking a few things to try and keep up with because you can't do everything. Mm. So that's probably the biggest challenge is what do you choose which things do you back and which things don't you? 
Belinda, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think there's two things. Can you hear me right? Um, I think there's a couple of things um, that as we shift from the industrial era, era to the imagination era, that we've got to lose our focus on what's been the object or the product um, in terms of um, the shiny new object and turn instead into what the consumer wants. And I think there's a massive shift in um, seeing what they want and there's a house of cards, programs like that, where they've actually done so much research and data to find what people want and who they want to see and that sort of thing. But the major thing, and I think this is happening to some degree, but not enough, is that leaders are not listening. And social media obviously is a, a really good platform for that. And there are some really strong leaders in New Zealand who are listening in social media and are listening on email, and that's um, Rod Jury from Zero, Chris, Chris Quinn from Telecom, Leanne um, Graham from GeoOp, and Jacinda Adhern from the Labour Party listens. She gets all her, um, her tweets to her phone. So you've got, there's got to be a lot more listening as opposed to um, throwing something out and getting people to buy it. Mm. Anyone else got any thoughts or observations on you know, the, the biggest challenge that a business is facing here? Um, actually, yeah, I, I think a lot of businesses don't have um, what-if strategies. Um, for instance, um, uh, my ISP provider last night had a DEF CON 5 scenario where um, basically they had outages everywhere, not telecom or Gen I, I'd like to say. Um, however, I spent an hour and a half on the phone just waiting for a customer service person to answer that call. Through that time, I cycled through uh, one and a half times through the city, the same city they've had for seven and a half years, um, to the point where I actually hung up. When my internet came back on board, I went onto their Facebook page. I had to like it to leave a comment. I left a comment to this point. Um, it wasn't responded to at all. I then got a text message, which was obviously in relation to trying to create an NPS score, asking me, hey, you've just recently contacted our contact centre, how was your experience? Would you like to answer this? I went to reply, and it told me that I was going to be charged to reply to this text message. <laughs> <laughs> At which point I think I'm going to switch to telecom. But um, <laughs> what, um, what I did this morning is I went back onto the Facebook page, and all the customer comments, and there are many, were still sitting there, but they had been put into a little box down the side, and none of them had been responded to. So I have to say, you know, you've got to have what if scenarios. Okay, what if, you know, you've got your normal business hours, but what if something happens outside those normal business hours? What's your scenario? Someone's got to be prepared to push the big red button. DEF CON 5's happened. We need to call an extra resource and actually answer our customers. Because that's not a connected customer. That's a completely disconnected customer experience right there. So that's my two cents worth. Mm. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, all of that to me just, uh, you know, sounds like massive amounts of uh, opportunity, obviously, but also, you know, th there's an IT department sitting behind there trying to respond, you know, to all of those experiences, and, and they need to do it quickly, and they want to be innovative, but they also don't want to have complete failure as well. So, Ed, are there any experiences you could share with us about how to balance that mix of you know, doing it fast, being innovative, but not completely dropping the ball. In, yeah, in a uh, absolutely. So, uh, you know, the eight months that we've been working at Digital Ventures has been has been a, a, a real eye opener and a, and a big sort of learning curve. And we took a pretty bold move to actually set up a new business unit at, outside of telecom or, or adjacent to to telecom to really innovate and look at new businesses. And, and if I, th you know, we, we adopt a lean canvas approach to, to testing business concepts, which is effectively you can, you can test a business concept and get into customer testing within, within about an hour or two to, to really sort of test whether you actually got something that has any value and any, any sort of relevance. And, and then fr from there actually adopt sort of prototype and agile methodologies that, that, that put very quickly allow you to sort of evolve what you're working on and continue to test and pivot. Uh, persevere or, or, or shut down. Um, if, if I think about what we've learned over the last seven or eight, seven or eight months, and we are, we, we are still learning, we, we're still not killing enough. Um, so, so that, you know, that t you know, takes a degree of sort of braveness to actually execute that. But if I also think about what we're spending now on to, to get to a particular stage in the process, we are doing it at maybe a half or a third of the cost that we were eight months ago, and we are improving each time. So if I think about um, how long it took us to, how, how long and how much it cost us to get skinny to market, and then how long 
uh, it took us to get big pipe on the new broadband service to market and the cost it was about half and we know we could do better again and do better again and, we, and actually when you start to improve those processes all of a sudden actually you can afford to pivot and shut down because you haven't spent two or three years and you know 50 million dollars or whatever it may be and you've got a completely vested interest in getting that across the line because actually you feel really feel you can't turn it off and, and start again mm. so I think it's it's a it's a mindset it's a process it, it's a bit like a muscle that you have to sort of learn and sort of develop it's a it's a, it's a number of different things at the same time mm. so fundamentally you're trying to deliver cost-effective services to market fast. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what's the role of the, of the marketing team in that? You know, marketing and IT, friends or foes? Uh, deep buddies? Um, you know, give us a bit of a sense of that. In, any one of you actually, it feels like. Okay, um, I'm probably quite equipped to answer that one. So I started out obviously working quite closely within IT in itself, being an analyst. I started my career as an analyst. Um, I then moved to working more closely with marketing and I then moved into CRM, so I now do the full end-to-end -end from the data through to the end-to-end -end customer experience. And in my experience, my, uh, IT tends to hold on too closely to the data and there's no translator between the IT data people and the marketing people. So the marketing people don't quite know what to ask for from the IT people and the IT people don't really know what to deliver to marketing. So I would encourage any organisation out there to, uh, if you feel like you've got IT and marketing is quite siloed, you just need to have someone in there as the translator, which is what they used to call me at the BNZ, they used to call me the translator. Karen, can you come and talk to the marketing team about data? Fine, absolutely, I can put it into some marketing terms. Um, you'll actually get better results, you'll get better campaigns because you'll actually get the accurate data coming out of the IT team. Can I just address something that, um, also, um, Geraldine, whoever was here this morning to hear Geraldine, that was brilliant, right? Yeah. Right, okay. She basically said everything I was going to say, so I have to have words <laughs> with her later. But um, she touched on the fact, we always talk about big data, and that scares a lot of people. She touched on the fact of talking about little data, and the analogy that I always use when I talk about that is, um, if you can imagine, uh, and I think we've all seen this on a TV show or whatever, there's a... a um, pea processing factory where people are standing there and they're picking out the, the wrong peas so the wrong peas don't get put into the package. Okay, reverse that. You've got big data. You want people there who are picking out the right bits of information to put into your marketing data mark to ensure that you're delivering the right data that are going to get the best results for your campaigns for your customers. So that's just a turning it on its head. Maybe take the big data stuff. You know, we know there's all this data out there. We just need to get the right people in to understand what's the right data to pick out and put in the package, if that makes sense. Joe, going back to your uh, original question around uh, marketing and uh, IT mm. teams, I mean, marketing dress different, they look different, they think different, <laughs> and they go to different bars, etc. And the <laughs> IT team, to be fair, um, they're pretty different as well. You know, they dress different, think different, act different, speak different. So I think it's really important for organisations, I haven't seen many that do it well, um, to have some sort of interface. I mean, because one without the other doesn't work. Um, you need both clearly. And uh, I think it's a, upon organisations to look for those that are in between a bit, you know, a bit more that way, a bit more left maybe, and uh, a bit more right, to sort of enable those and, and pick those people that are ambassadors within teams to engage better. Because you still need the detail, you know, real detail, geeky sort of getting through the nuts and bolts, cross every T, dot every I. We also need the guy that dresses a bit flash, gets up there and can sell a story. So I think it's that, that piece to get success in that space. And, and in larger the organisation, I guess the risk is how organisations can tend to be more siloed. And bridging those gaps is absolutely critical for, for getting the end customer in, in the space. Mm. Can I just throw something in there? I think that the, the challenge with, um, that I've observed uh, with marketing teams, and I've worked in quite large organisations, but um, seeing the marketing team, which I've always been peripheral to because I've sort of been PR, social media, and the ICT team, and there was a lot of focus within ICT on detail, and that's what I've always found is a lot of detail focus, a lot of um, not short-term thinking, 
but um, you know, quite different goals to marketing who have quite sort of visionary goals. But I think the, the problem comes is the goals aren't the same. And I feel like there needs to be, and I think we'll talk, we'll talk about this later, about leadership and that the, all the goals need to align and then, the big, then everyone can see the same picture. But I've always seen marketing people with a whole other goal and, and it comes back to that shiny new thing as well because if they're both best friends, which they should be, then you're not focused on the shiny thing, you're focused on the customer and the customer journey and what they need. So that's what I think. Mm. You, you talked about leadership, Belinda, and I guess a kind of nice segue to the role of the CEO in working with this connected customer. You know, the, the leader, the person that speaks it all, and, and you know, a bystander watching what, what's happening. Ed, your, your thoughts? You're, you're in it right yeah, now? Look, easy, easy question, mm. you know, at, at, a, at a high level. Absolutely, leader. Um, you know, when it comes to actually driving um, a greater focus on, on the customer. Um, you, you know, the world, the world is changing, you know, massively. Um, you, know, the relationship, you know, the relationships with customers um, are, are at so many different levels, you know. So, it's, you know, it's not just, a, you know, for, for a telco, a broadband connection or a mobile connection, it's now all of the applications and services the customer is, is using. And you, you, as a business, have very little control over what they are, you know. So, so you know, today we have the likes of Facebook, um, you know, very popular, and, and, and WhatsApp, but actually if you talk to uh, people who are under 18, actually that's already changing. It's already already moving, whether whether we like yeah, whether we cheese. like it or not, <laughs> mm. uh, or Whisper or some of the, some of the other services. And and I think the role of the leader is actually you have to have to acknowledge that it's changing, and you have to have a strategy that not only uh, copes and caters for today and for the next year, but also actually acknowledges that you need to build agility into the business that you're that you're running and you're leading. Otherwise, you're going to get caught. Mm. You're going to get overtaken. Um, you know, with lighter weight, more agile businesses that can just move more quickly than you. Mm. Thanks, Ed. Um, at this point, I'd last, like to ask if there's anyone in the audience who would want to take the opportunity to direct a question straight to one of the, of the panel members. I can see about the first seven rows. <laughs> uh, down in the front right here, actually. Thank you. Yes, my name is Arjan Nooduk. Um, I was I'm hearing you talking about bridge functions between the silos, but for me, what's the role of product ownership? Because I think actually that we should bring the business down to the technology and have the people that build the technology be engaged with the business. So how do you approach to bring the product ownership and marketing aspects to the work floor? You wanna take that, I'm Ed? Happy to have yep. <laughs> Um, so I'm a, pro I'm a product manager by, by background, so, so I completely agree. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, um, for, for me, that doing a good job in that role has, has actually meant that you need to be the bridge between, between the customer, customer and the marketing teams and the technology teams and the art of the possible and actually working out actually whether you've got something there that you can actually, you've got a customer need and a customer desire and you've got the ability to deliver that in an economic way. And that, so, so from my perspective, actually, there is a huge product management need, need and requirement in, in any business. I still think if you really want to support an organisation, yes, there's a piece where you bring the technology in to support that, but you can't just look at the technology. You need to look at the, what that particular organisation's outputs are, what their products are, what their customer engagements are, and actually learn them. Roll up your sleeves and actually understand their day-to-day -day issues and see where uh, a company such as Genoi can help support that. And I think that's a bit that is often uh, missed. We put our technology cap on and we're experts at that, but we're not necessarily an expert at, say, banking or postal or whatever other industry we're supporting. And the reality is they don't necessarily care about um, the technology piece, but they want that to help them on their journey. And it's understanding, rolling up your sleeves, and I think getting inside the business and actually looking at the day-to-day -day issues they face, like the example we heard from Cameron Four, bad customer experience, understanding those that happen on a daily basis and seeing where you, as a, you know, a supporter, can, can make a difference in that space. Also, can I add one thing to that? It's, it's one thing to understand the technology or the product and, and how that fits within the business, 
but if you don't understand the data that's collected and therefore analysed that can come out of that, there's a disconnect there. So technology, it's just technology, but you've got to put data into it. Mm. And the data you put into it's obviously got to be accurate because data, bad data in, bad data out. I mean, that's just the way it goes. So that's the kind of... The, the, the data for me is always the, the joining piece between everything. And mm. Can I just add to that in, in terms of the data? Is, uh, I think the challenge in the business is not so much the silos, is that there's no listening to the silos and there's no space for people to listen to the silos. And I think that actually the, the annoying, scratchy, was it the whistling wheel, with the, you know, squeaky wheel, needs to, you know, you need to listen to them and find out if what they're saying is worthwhile. Because they, because I know when I work at social med and social media, I'm at the coalface, I'm with the customers, talking to the customers, solving problems, helping them along, or just sort of putting out the fires and just sort of keeping them reasonably calm. But then if no one's listening to me back in the organisation, then I'm just a false front. I'm not the real picture of the story. And so unless there's a channel for me to feed it back and go straight to them and to, and to actually get a response that's respectful and saying, this is what the customer's telling me. And they're like, oh, but this is, no, this is what the customer's telling me. So I think that the listening is the problem and it, it has been in every organisation I've been in, except for the one now, yay. <laughs> This, what this should say is a connected customer slash business. Because mm -hmm. if you don't have a connected business, if you're not integrated and collaborative, it's not going to flow through to your customer anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's very well said. Great. Another question out there? To make one up. Okay. <laughs> Let's, uh, I want to pose this question to each of you actually and um, you know, have a think about how you might answer it. If you are starting on the journey to becoming more connected as an organisation through your business, end to end, across your business, with customers, what is the first thing that you must do? I'll start this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll start. the very first thing you must do is map your data architecture. Mm. Know your data, map your data architecture, get a metadata dictionary happening. Without knowledge of that, you've got nothing. You've got no nowhere to move forward from. That's, that's the, the line in the sand for me. Okay. Can I ag agree with you? Oh, sorry, let's <laughs> just take over this end. I want to agree with you on that, but and also, again, I think it comes back to informing um, the, 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 cl the clients who are within the organisation so that everyone is p across that data or, and everyone reading that data and everyone understands that data and how it connects to the vision and how it connects to the leader of that you know, vision and where you're all going. And I think that it's, it, you know, even daily is not enough. I think everyone's got to be on top of that data from reception to security through to um, the CEO. And that's when you get everyone in the movement and they're all moving in the same direction. So you won't have those barriers and breakdown. I'm, I'm going to try and jump in and jump in a, a, a sort of head. The, the, look, the fir first thing I think you need to do is listen, watch and learn. Yeah, you, need to, uh, just un you need to understand the customer f you know, far better than generally most businesses do. Um, and, and it's only from there, actually, you can really understand yeah. whether there is, a, there is a customer need and a desire that you have the capability of fulfilling. And if, and if you do, then great. And then you can move into, into execution. But un unless you know the problem that you're trying to solve and the customer experience you're trying to deliver, you, 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 you're flying blind, really. Mm. Yeah. Totally Closing words, Murray? No, well, I think that's uh, Ed summed it up really well, because I think we can go data, data, which is great, and we can have you know, business case upon business case and everything else, but at the end of the day, if you don't really understand what you're trying to solve and put the basic principles around that, you, you go in nowhere, and then you've got to find your first followers within the organisation and within the support, and, and then start that whole, whole piece. Hmm. <laughs> Starting and finishing this one. <laughs> but um, the one thing I've always done, which whatever client I've worked on or worked within, is become the customer myself. So actually become the customer. So whether you're the CEO or the CFO or the CIO, or you work in marketing or you're a receptionist, become the customer of your own business to actually understand what they go through and what their pain points are. It's the best way ever. Mm, great. Well, thank you guys. Some absolutely fantastic gems of information from your own experience, from your own experience as customers. Uh, interesting story that you shared with us before, Karen. So really appreciate <laughs> it and thank you very much uh, for your time today. Thank you. Cheers, thank you. Thank you.